why don't we start why don't we start with your father tell me okay. about your father my dad was uh, william e cordero and uh he was an air force navigator had been in the air force for seven years after his uh commission. He graduated from the ROTC program at Loyola University in Los Angeles and uh, went into the Air Force active duty in 1957 and uh, was from a family of Spanish explorers. Uh, it may not be politically correct these days, but uh, our ancestors came to California back before the American Revolution and they were uh, helping to establish the California missions that are so popular and iconic for tourists and the faithful. And uh, that was our, our roots in California. So we've been here a very long time. Uh, my dad's parents were divorced. Uh, neither of them had any more than an eighth grade education, but uh, his father, my, my grandfather was a blacksmith. He had a, an eighth grade education and he was a, uh, an ornamental iron worker making railings and gates and doors and lanterns and all kinds of stuff in the Santa Barbara area of uh, California. And uh, much of that is still in evidence today. You can still go through lots of the homes and the mansions in Montecito and the mission there in Santa Barbara, the courthouse, all the iconic places, and you still see my grandfather's work. But uh, I don't know that he ever envisioned his son going to college, but my dad did. And uh, in the late 1950s, it wasn't common for Hispanic men to go to college. Uh, much less become officers in the military, and, and my dad did both. And uh, while he was at college, he met a nursing student in Los Angeles, uh, a young Irish girl named Kathleen Carroll. And so the two of them were married, my dad was commissioned, and they began their life together as uh, an officer and a gentleman, and his no longer nurse wife. Mm -hmm. And where did they go from there? Um, almost immediately, they were transferred to Texas and were in the El Paso area for a couple of years, and then were transferred from there to James Connolly Air Force Base in Waco. And that's where um, they were just before I was born. A couple months before I was born, Dad got transferred back to Oxnard, California, which is about 40 miles south of Santa Barbara. And uh, there was an Air Force base there at the time, moved out there. I was born a couple months later, and uh, my younger brother was born while we were there in Oxnard. Uh, Dad was just training at that time. And so you're talking about 1961 that we moved to Oxnard. And in the spring of 63, my younger brother, the fourth of the children, was born. And then in November of 63, dad was transferred to, or deployed, dad was deployed to Vietnam. And he landed it at Tonsonut, I'm sorry, he landed at Benoit Air Base, just outside of Saigon, on the day President Kennedy was killed. So it's pretty surreal when you, you read this letter he wrote home to my mom, talking about how they had just received this news that the president had been killed and he just landed there. And, uh, you know, it had to be unsettling to say the least to not only be deployed to this hot spot where you probably couldn't find it on a map, but not only that, you land there and then you find out that the leader of the free world, the president of the United States of America has been assassinated in Dallas. So, uh, that didn't get things off to a good start for him. For the first year that he was there, from November of 63 to the summer of 64, he was with the Air Force Air Commandos, and they were training, quote unquote, uh, the South Vietnamese Air Force. And uh, as I understand it, each of the B-26s that they were flying was uh, manned by two Americans and one Vietnamese. <laughs> and so I don't know who was doing the training, if there was any training, but um, flew a number of, of combat missions and reconnaissance missions there in B-26s. And then in the summer of 64, we got orders that we were gonna go join dad and he was being transferred to a new unit, but we were moving from California to 
Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines. So the B-26s, which had been a holdover from World War II, were being decommissioned. And dad was now going to be flying B-57s, uh, low range, um, long distance reconnaissance jet bomber. And uh, but he's going to fly those. And we were all going to live together as one big happy family in a uh, off base housing there in Pampanga, uh, the community right there outside of uh, Clark Air Force Base. It was uh, some people called the neighborhood Clark View, Angeles City, whatever you want to call it today, but uh, right there adjacent to Clark Air Force Base. Mm. And so, did that happen? Did you go there? We did. We, we landed there in the summer of 64, mom and four kids and dad. And, and Wait, for the next, kids. yeah. So I had two older, my older brother, my older sister, I see. me okay. as the third child, and then my youngest brother who was born um, in the spring of 63. So now we're in summer of 64. We land at Clark and, you know, by today's standards, it's this crazy thing where dad was home for a couple of weeks with us in Clark. And then he would fly to Vietnam and for a couple of weeks would go on missions and drop bombs and blow things up and then come back home. And we'd start the whole cycle all over again. We did that until June of 65. And at that point, we were about six weeks away from being sent back to the States to uh, Mather Air Force Base in Sacramento. And, you know, as fate always has it, um, dad went on what turned out to be the final mission. It was Father's Day weekend, 1965. He and the, uh, he was the navigator. He and the pilot took off from Clark. They flew to Saigon. And then from there to Da Nang in the central part of the country, they got orders and instructions and they were part of a bombing mission. There were two B-57s and a C-130 flying in between the two. And somewhere along the Vietnam Lao border, there was a part of the Ho Chi Minh Trail they were supposed to hit and something happened. And we don't know what it was. We still don't know what it was. We still don't know. Um, the other B-57 and the C-130 lost contact with them. They don't know whether they were hit by enemy fire, if there was some mechanical malfunction, we just don't know. And for the longest time, we were led to believe that the plane went down in Vietnam. And in 1994, we found out that indeed the plane is actually in Laos. So there are still major sections of the plane that rest in the jungles of Laos in a pretty remote area, which begs a whole bunch of other questions. Why were they there? Did they get lost? Did they know what they were doing? Were they on a mission that nobody else knew about? We don't know. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I suppose it's possible that if they were hit, you know, they may have drifted off course before, before crashing. Who knows? Right. Yeah. No, you're just a little guy at the time, right? You're four years old. I was old. four. I was four when the plane was lost. Yeah. Yeah. So what memories do you have of your dad? Specifically of him, they're kind of ghost figures. You know, I, I don't remember ever looking him in the eye and saying, that's my dad. But uh, I, I remember him smoking cigarettes. I remember him... Uh, coming home from work at the Air Force Base. And when he would do that, we would ride on his motorcycle. I don't know what kind of motorcycle it was, a little scooter kind of thing, but we would ride with him on that through the sugarcane fields. And uh, that was some of our afternoon fun when he got off work. Uh, we vacationed a couple times there in the Philippines, went to the officer's club, went swimming there, had you know dinner at the officer's club and things like that. Um, and I kind of vaguely remember a conversation that I had with him the day that he left that Father's Day weekend in 65. But, um, you know, I don't know if it's a figment of my imagination or if it's something that actually occurred. But what do four-year-olds remember? I, I just don't know. Yeah, that's why I asked the question, because I have very few memories of being that, <clears throat> being that age. And I don't know how many of the ones I do have are even accurate, you know. Right. Yeah. Um, so... I mean, what happens to the family at that point? I mean, the, I'm assuming that since they had no idea what happened to the plane, that he's 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 considered missing at that point. 
that's exactly what happened. And so as practicing Catholics, uh, the squadron commander and his wife, a few other wives, and the Catholic chaplain from Clark Air Base came to our house off base, and you got the proverbial knock on the door, and um, some kind family took the four of us kids and scuttled us away, and mom spoke with the adults and um, was told by the squadron commander that it probably would be a very long time before there was ever any answer. And uh, I don't know the exact words he used or if he was hinting at something, but um, she does recall that. Um, and then, you know, we were given the logistical challenge that we had to leave pretty quick. So I think within a week, we were on our way back to California. So, you know, here's this woman, my mom, she's not 30 years old. She's got four kids. She's 7,500 miles from home. Her husband's missing in the jungles of a war zone. And oh, by the way, she's expecting child number five. And she's got to pack up the house. And yeah, most of, of all that. Fortunately, some of the Air Force families around us took care of the packing and stuff. They, uh, you know, they got stuff either packed up or sold and they shipped stuff back to us in California. So she didn't have to do that. But, you know, and I, I hear stories of uh, folks feeling that their lives are stressed today. I think about that and that litany of things we just read off about my mom, not 30 years of age, four kids, all under the age of six, husband's missing in a war zone, 7,500 miles from home. She's pregnant with child number five. She's got to go back to California. That's a pretty big menu to, to tackle. Yeah, and isn't it amazing how uh, <clears throat> how military families rally around each other in times like that? I uh, I don't think I told you this. My father was uh, 20 years in the Army. He, he enlisted in 1958 and retired in 1978. So, excuse me. <clears throat> and so the entire time that we were in Vietnam. My father was in the army, but he just, they never sent him to Vietnam. Wow. Um, but I do remember, you know, being a military brat, uh, just the way families were with each other. Yeah. My mother still talks about it. She's 85 years old and, you know, she still loves to talk about how great those years were and how much she felt like part of a community that, you know, frankly didn't, it was not the experience we had after my dad retired from the army. And, and you're preaching to the choir because even when we came home and dad was ultimately missing from June of 65 until the spring of 69, we didn't have that. We were in kind of a limbo is probably the most polite way to put it where you'd get an occasional update from the air force on something but for the most part, we were back to civilian life. Um, you didn't have the community of support that you had when you were living, when you were active duty military. Nobody really wanted you around because you were the sign of the worst possible scenario. And right, right. so, you know, when I talk about folks in Sons and Daughters in Touch and these people in the picture behind me, most of them felt the same way. It was that, that weird experience where either because their, their dads were missing or because they'd been confirmed killed in action, it wasn't something that was talked about a whole bunch just because nobody really wanted to hear about it. And that gets into the whole Vietnam issue. But um, for us coming home for those next four years, you know, the, the number of kids in my grade school class who knew about my dad's situation, you could probably count on one hand. Yeah. Uh, just, they didn't know. So, I mean, you said that your family's been in the area, has been in that area for a long time. Um, what kind of support did your mother have for those four years? I mean, did your father's family, were they close by geographically? Yeah, uh, we came back to this town in, the LA area called San Pedro. It's the port of Los Angeles. And we did that because that's where mom grew up and that's where her parents were. And so they were an incredible rock of support there. And then my dad's parents were up in Santa Barbara, hundred miles away. 
And uh, if they weren't providing interpersonal care and support, they were providing some financial support. So when we started school, my grandfather paid for us to go to the local Catholic school because tuition was fairly inexpensive and, uh, you know, it might've been $20 a month per kid or something like that. So um, he was paying for that. And uh, so we had great support from all of them. It was uh, what was necessary. And, and that's what they did to, to help ease some of that concern during the MIA years. Now how many, how, how much older are your older brothers, and your, your, the two eldest children in your family? We're a military family. So my brother, my oldest brother was born January 59. My sister was born March of 60. I was born July 61. My brother just below me was born April 63. And then the fifth child was born in January of 66, six months after dad was lost. Wow. So <clears throat> during those four years from 64 to 69, uh, what, what, talk a little bit about what it was like for you kids. I mean, did you ever talk with each other about, about your father? Uh, you know, if, if we sat around the sandbox and looked at each other and asked, what do you think happened to dad? Or what do you think happened to dad? I don't recall that. I think the, the most clear memory I have is of the five of us kids saying our, our prayers at night, our good night prayers, and mom would be standing in the hallway so that in this bedroom, he had a couple kids, that bedroom, he had a couple kids, and then in another bedroom was the only girl. And um, we would always finish the prayers with um, the line, God bless daddy, wherever you are. Yeah, I can't imagine what those four years must have been like for her. It it had an impact, and I say that um, both positively and negatively. My mom, you know, she's a strong Irish woman, but it it it, it cost her. Um, she had some challenges, emotional challenges that that came along with that, and and I, I think because of all of the work that I've done over the last 35 years with Sons and Daughters in Touch and comparing that to the life experience of my mom, I can see where it is evident that the Department of Defense and the VA looked at scenarios like the life of Kathleen Cordero and said, we can't let this happen anymore. We didn't do enough for a woman like that or for her kids. We've got to do better. And so when you look at the way that families are cared for today, you can see the improvement. It ain't perfect. There's no question that it's far from perfect, but it is so much better, so much better than it was before. I mean, when you think about it, my mom had to rely on the local parish priest to be her counselor in this scenario. And she should have had professional counseling she should have had professional support. The kids should have had that kind of support, and they do today. But back in the 60s, it didn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened in 1969? Another knock on the door. Um, the Air Force came to our home, and mom already knew this was coming. She just didn't know when. So a year before this, she borrowed some money from what would ultimately have been my dad's life insurance policy. She borrowed some money from a relative and bought a house for $35,000. She was gonna get 25,000 in a life insurance settlement from, from dad. So uh, she borrowed the money, bought a house and that's where we were living. And about a year later, we got the knock on the door and they said, um, Number one, we're here to confirm that he is not coming home. We have some remains and we've decided that we're going to bury the two of them, the pilot and the navigator in the same grave. And we're gonna bury him in uh, Jefferson Barracks, Missouri. And fortunately my mom and the wife of the pilot, 
they were in North Carolina, we're in California, the two ladies got together and said, no, that ain't happening. And so they said, bury them in Arlington, and they did. And so there was um, May 1st of 1969, there was a, uh, a funeral at Fort Myer Chapel, and then the burial in section 46 of Arlington. And uh, as it turns out, it is a very high profile location. Anybody that's been to Arlington has visited the space shuttle memorials while you're on the tour and you see the tombs of the unknown soldier, um, or you, and then from there you walk across the, the traffic circle to the space shuttle memorials. And then there's a sidewalk that leads up to the mast of the main from Havana Harbor. Um, when you do that, if you walk that 100 yards or whatever it is, you walk right past the gravesite of Charles Lovelace and William Cordero. It's right there in the front row on the sidewalk. It wasn't intended to be like that in 1969. That's just the way that they engineered the, the layout of the cemetery. And so folks go by there all the time and I get messages asking, hey, I stopped by and saw your dad, or, or uh, I stopped by and saw this, is this your dad? And, and uh, so it's, it's kind of cool knowing that they are there and they are always remembered. Yeah. Yeah, so at this point, I mean, you're old enough to remember. You're old enough to remember all of that. Yeah, I, I remember the funeral. Uh, I wore my Cub Scout uniform. Um, something in my mind said, I want to be in uniform. And so I wore my Cub Scout uniform. And there's, there is a picture, an official photographer um, from the Air Force took a picture. And it's, you can see me from the side and I'm wearing my Cub Scout uniform. And uh, I didn't become a, an Eagle Scout or anything like that. But I wore my Cub Scout uniform to my dad's funeral. Mm -hmm. So you, uh, I mean, what, talk, can you just talk a little bit about the the rest of your youth? I mean, did yeah. you? So uh, it was, you know, after the funeral, um, life just kind of went on. And, um, you know, for me personally, there were a couple of unique things about that time before and after the, the funeral. Um, because the funeral was taking place in Arlington and so much of our family was in California, both sides of the family in California, and they weren't going to be able to go to Arlington. Um, they had a funeral at our local parish, the Catholic parish in San Pedro. And though the casket was empty, there was uh, a casket, flag draped casket, an honor guard and the whole thing. And um, in the Catholic church, second grade is when most kids received their first Holy Communion. And I was supposed to receive my first Holy Communion in the middle of the month of May, but my mom worked out an arrangement with the teachers, the priests, and the whole thing. And so at that funeral in our hometown, before we went to Arlington, I actually received that sacrament of the Catholic Church at my dad's funeral. It wasn't a big deal, but it was just kind of cool, something I remember because I was eight and I can remember it. Um, and then we went to the funeral at Arlington. Um, one of the things, another lesson that has been learned, and perhaps the most egregious thing that ever happened in that whole four-year saga, is that the Department of Defense, the Air Force, whoever it was, said to my mom, we will pay for you and two family members to fly from California to Washington, D.C. for the funeral. Now, this is a widow who's got five kids. So they're going to pay for the widow, and they're going to pay for two others, and she gets to choose who it is. So, and cross-country air travel at that time was not affordable like it is today. So my mom decided that the two oldest kids, my brother and sister, would be the two that the Air Force paid for. Her aunt said that she was going to pay her own way and go to take care of the kids. And my, my mom's parents paid for me to go to the funeral. The, the worst part is that the two youngest boys didn't get to go. And 
when you talk about lessons learned, that would never happen today. I mean, can you imagine if that story got out in the local news that, you know, this story has happened and the Air Force isn't going to fly the whole family back there, you know, some Hollywood celebrity or some rich Wall Street person would say, here, here, here's a check, fly him first class and put him up at the Ritz or something like that. Mm -hmm. But in 1969, my two youngest brothers didn't get to go to their dad's funeral. Why do you think it was so important for your aunt for you to go? Um, I think my, my mom's parents knew that I was eight years old, second grade. I was old enough to fend for myself a little bit. And uh, I didn't need a lot of babysitting. So I think that's why they paid for me to go. Right. And then my aunt decided to go to be the support for my mom because she was going to be there to bury her husband and have three of her children there. And she needed someone because her parents weren't going. My dad's parents weren't going. Nobody could afford to go. Yeah. And so my aunt, aunt, aunt Seal, she was um, my mom's father's sister. So her ma maternal aunt, she could afford to go. And so she came basically to be the Aide de camp, the the babysitter of the three Cordero kids that were there. Mm -hmm. So after the funeral, you go back to uh, California, and then what, what's what's a young Tony Cordero like? Uh, a very good C minus student. Um, <laughs> I I look back on it now and I wonder. You know, I was not a good student in school, and I don't know that the nuns ever expected me to get through eighth grade, but um, I, I think a lot of that of my life is a fog because I just didn't know what was going on. And so I don't have a whole lot of memories of first and second and third and fourth grade. And, um, you know, then things started to come into focus and mom remarried and, uh, we started growing up and we were still very well influenced by both sets of grandparents and uh you know I, I was never a good student but i i was pretty good in in different sports and stuff like that and uh, so i managed to get through elementary school uh was an altar boy and all those kinds of things and and um then went on to high school and again i don't know that too many of the people that i interacted with knew the, the story. Uh, in fact, I spoke to a guy this morning on the phone. I've known him for 40 years and I mentioned something in passing about it. And he said, I never knew that about you. So, um, you know, it's just a lot of people didn't know that. And when I got to high school, high school is a whole lot bigger than elementary school. Most of my teachers didn't know that. My high school football coach was a Vietnam veteran. He didn't know until I told him going into my senior year of high school what was going on in my life. And so um, it was a function of the environment that we grew up in in the 60s and 70s where the unpopular nature of the war and all of that that went along with it told us, just don't talk about it. Don't share it with anybody. Um, I, I went to a movie one time I think when I was a senior in high school, I went to see Apocalypse Now. And there's a scene where the riverboat's going um, along the river and on the side on the bank of the river is a tree and the remnants of a helicopter that had crashed. And Huey went down and there were a couple of uh, presumably American service members in the tree and, and they had been killed there. And it just, it was kind of gruesome and, and it, stuck with me because I thought, wow, is that the kind of fate that my dad met? And we didn't know. But, um, you know, go through high school and again, um, not a great student, pretty good at sports. Um, and then you know, I ended up going to community college and, and decided, I don't know where I'm going in life, don't know what I want to do went to community college and uh, tried to play football for a little, for a little while. And then knee injury ended, ended that. And uh, I knew all along that I wanted to attend the university of Southern California. And 
uh, I had to find a way to fight and scratch to get into it. So something clicked in my brain and I finally decided to get smart about school and my grades improved and I, I managed to get in there. But the problem was that the University of Southern California is a private institution and it's not I think a lot, I think a lot of people, a lot of people don't know that. I mean, just they don't. The, right. Because it's called university of Southern California. It sounds like a public school. Right. And, uh, it's a non-denominational private university. Um, so I fought and I scratched to get in, but once I got in, then the big question was, how do I pay for this? And once again, another lesson learned, I had to beg and borrow and do a lot of other crazy things in order to get through school. Um, I can tell it now because everybody knows it, but I worked as a football manager. I, because I couldn't play, I was a student manager of the football team. And in the early 1980s, we were students, we were part of the football team, we got the same benefits as the football team. And so we got tickets to the game and they were good seats. And there were boosters who were willing to pay for that. And that transaction helped pay for some of my college tuition, because there wasn't a nonprofit or a foundation that was saying, we'll take care of Tony's cost of education. Right. So I did it myself. Yeah. What'd you study? Public relations. Oh, no kidding. Came out of the school of journalism with a degree in public relations. And um, I have a journalism degree from the other USC. <laughs> wow. Well, it, um, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was a great experience. I wouldn't trade any of it for anything. Uh, it's where I wanted to be. And even though I had to pay for it myself and fight and scratch, uh, I think I got $300 a month from the VA or something like that. But beyond that, there was nothing. So I drove to school every day. I lived at home at my mom's house and I drove 23 miles to school every day because I couldn't afford to live there. Right. Yeah. Same here. So at this point, you know, you're, so you're, you're finishing up your journalism degree. Um, still no contact with other sons and daughters at this point. None, none at all. Um, and interestingly, at the same time that I was at USC, there was a gold star son playing football at the University of Alabama, Derek Thomas. Derek Thomas is now in the NFL Hall of Fame. And of course, rest his soul. He, he passed away, uh, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. But Derek was playing football at the University of Alabama, I think a few years after I was there at SC or something like that. We never met on the field, but um, he was playing there. And then at Arizona State, I believe, was another football player by the name of Dan Saliamua, who was playing defensive tackle, I think, at the University of Arizona, or I'm sorry, Arizona State University. And we certainly played against them. And uh, Dan is a gold star son. His dad was in the Marines, killed in Vietnam. Dan and Derek ultimately went on to the NFL and played together for the Kansas City Chiefs for about four or five years. So the defense of the Kansas City Chiefs in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, had two gold star sons playing for them. Hmm. But, and you, were, and you yeah. were aware of this somehow? No, I was not. You were not? Okay. No, I became aware of it after the fact. But at the time, I, I, uh, I didn't know either of them when I was at USC and they were in college as well. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it was no big deal. The only time that people at USC knew about my life story was couple times a semester, I had to go check in at the veterans office. And for the most part, they were expecting to see veterans. They weren't expecting to see this kid who's getting dependent benefits and what do you call him and who is he and all that kind of stuff. So uh, yeah, it was, uh, it, it was just, it was a unique time uh, where that was just a part of who I am. It wasn't something that was a broadcast across my forehead and said, this guy is a gold star son and, you know, he shouldn't be paying his tuition. There should be a foundation taking care of it. Um, and I was fine with that. It was okay. I was kind of living in the shadows, doing my own thing, hoping to win football games and uh, trying to get good grades. Yeah. At some point, something must have triggered your curiosity about other gold star 
children. Yeah, it did. And um, it was after I graduated, um, while I was going to college, I was working as an usher at the forum in Inglewood where the Lakers and Magic Johnson were having showtime and all that stuff. A uh, great job for a college student. And one day I was working in LA Kings hockey game and I looked over at the other section next to me and there was a young lady um, who was an usher as well. And uh, she was helping folks find their seats in the, the expensive section. I was in the cheap seats. And uh, I gave her a wink and a nod and we've now been married for 38 years, have four kids and four grandkids. But uh, I met my wife, Deanna, working there at the forum, and uh, that was all going on during college. And so we got married, and uh, it was in the late 80s when I was about to outlive my dad. And I started thinking, gosh, I'm going to be 30 in a couple of years. And my dad was killed a month before his 30th birthday. What will it be like to outlive your dad? I didn't know. So I started asking questions and a Vietnam veteran in Sacramento, California said to me, if there was an organization for you, I would know about it and I don't know about it. So call this woman at the Friends of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. She lost her husband in the war and you should talk to her and see what comes of it. And I did. Hey, sorry, and you, said, you said this was late 80s. Yeah, 1989. Right. And the wall was dedicated in 82. Correct. Was that an event for you at all? Not really. I mean, I was in college at the time. It was Veterans Day 1982. Um, and I was managing the football team. So, you know, I think at that time, uh, yeah, I don't know which game that would have coincided with on the USC football schedule, but school and, and football were the, the most important things. I knew the wall was being dedicated but it wasn't a big focus for me. Okay. It really wasn't. I knew of it, but it wasn't a big focus. Okay. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Oh. I just wanted, yeah, I wanted to fill in that gap because it- That's a good point. Yeah, it's a very good point. Uh, and I, I think that sentiment holds true for my mom and for my siblings as well. None of us were really drawn to the wall and, and thought much about it. But then um, I get a hold of this woman at the Friends of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial her name was Wanda Ruffin. We start talking. She tells me that she has a daughter who was born after her husband was lost. He was a naval aviator, James T. Ruffin. And uh, so we start talking. And one thing leads to another. And the next thing you know, we get a couple of uh, media outlets interested in telling this story. And on Father's Day of 1989, Maria Shriver was a reporter for NBC Sunday Today. And she did a story that aired on Father's Day 1989 talking about three kids who lost their dads in the Vietnam War and they are now coming of age because here they are in their 20s and these kids are growing up. And so, you know, that was a great story. It was nice, but there needed to be something more. And uh, that led to Parade Magazine, which in the 1980s was an insert in the Sunday newspapers, something that doesn't exist anymore, right? right, <laughs> uh, right. I think, I don't know if Parade is still printed, but I, I know it's got an online component. But at that time, Parade Magazine did a story um, that ran in Memorial Day weekend, 1990. And that was huge because what it did was it hit so many people across the country. And if the people behind me didn't see it, their relatives did. And someone read the article and said, I got to send this to Susie. I got to send this to Joe. They need to know about it. And they did that. And remember, in 1990, 8990, you didn't have cell phones. You didn't have the internet. You didn't have email. So all this stuff took place via the US Postal Service. And the article got shared all over the country and 1500 people said, that article is about me. So they, they read the article and they said, 
someone is finally telling the story of my life. And there wasn't a big PR firm that was mapping out this strategy and saying, let's do this and this and this and this. And six months after this, we'll do that. This just serendipitously happened. But 1,500 people said, you're telling the story of my life. And in the article, they featured three or four of us. And one of the comments that I made was, I'd love to have an event at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial where everybody could get together and just be together there for the first time. And that's what catapulted us to... Father's Day, 1992. Uh, but most of you, I mean, I'm assuming that most of these other 1,500 folks, they, they grew up like you did, right? They didn't have contact with other kids or other families who'd endured a similar loss. They kept it to themselves. And this would be the correct. first time that they could look into a crowd and recognize each Absolutely other. Absolutely correct. I couldn't have said it any better. When Father's Day, 1992 happened, it was the first time for most of us that we had met others who lost their dads in the war and the first time that we'd seen our dad's names on the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. So it was huge, but I want to back up for just a second because Father's Day 1989, Maria Shriver's story, if you watch it, it's on the YouTube, the SDIT YouTube channel. Uh, they do some coverage of, or they at least mention the very first Father's Day rose ceremony that took place at the wall on Father's Day morning, 1989. And it was the people in the article and the people that I had made contact with at the Friends of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial who were making this Father's Day a reality. They recognized after all this stuff got started, they said, we got to do something about Father's Day. And so they got together and they acquired roses and they placed them at the wall and uh, there wasn't anything formal about it, but they brought roses to the wall for the very first time on that Father's Day, 1989. Uh, and so that began the tradition that began the tradition of Father's Day that continues now. Uh, Father's Day, 1992 took a long time to plan because here we had again, uh, a bunch of people saying, let's do something, but did we have the resources to do it? And we really didn't. We didn't have money. We didn't have an organization. We didn't have worker bees. So we had to do it all ourselves. And with the help of the Friends of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial and the support of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund, we were able to put together an event in June of 1992 that brought all of those sons and daughters together for the first time. And uh, it was powerful. It was really, really powerful. And CBS Sunday morning thought so much of the story when it was pitched to them, they covered it and they aired a, a story in, on July, July 4 weekend of 1992 that encapsulated what we did on Father's Day weekend. And that was the beginning of something. It was. The ball was rolling. And uh, again, there wasn't an organization or there, there wasn't a template for what we were doing. We made this up as we went along. And much like the Vietnam veterans themselves, when they needed an organization for themselves, they built it themselves. We did the same thing. Um, we took the cue from them and we built this ourselves. And I mean, it was a challenge and there was a lot of mercurial up and down. And sometimes we go for a while without much happening. And um, we had another Father's Day in 1993. Somebody emotionally said, we got to do this every year. And everybody said, okay, yeah, let's. And then you realize, wait a minute, that means I got to fly back from California to Washington next June. So we started spacing them out. We did Father's Day 92 and 93 and 97, and then Father's Day 2000. And then at that point, we decided, let's do it every five years. So we did 2000, 2005, 10, 15. We were supposed to do 2020, but COVID interrupted that. So uh, we did a virtual event. But 
you know, it, one of the things that I think makes this such an incredible story is the support of the Vietnam veterans themselves. And I'm saying that uppercase and lowercase. Uppercase Vietnam veterans of America have been the incredible uncles and father figures to us that we didn't have. And Vietnam veterans, lowercase, or every one of those, whether they were combat veterans or Vietnam era veterans or nurses who served, they have all rallied around us for the last 33 years to make this happen. And when I think about the people who were there in the beginning that made this, they were guys like the president of, of Vietnam Veterans of America, George Duggins, um, and Um, I can say this because I know it's now public information, but we got news this morning that Tom Corey, another one of the presidents of Vietnam Veterans of America, died last night. Tom Corey is the world. America needs 330 million Tom Corys. George Duggins, Tom Corey, Bill Chester, Jan Scruggs, Rich Sanders, so many other people. Uh, Janice Nark, Marsha Four. I just, you know, the, the names go on and on and on and on. All these people whose young lives were changed and influenced by their time and service in Vietnam, they came home, they befriended the people you see behind me, and that had never been done before. One more time, you think about it today, the veterans who served in the global war on terror befriending the families of the fallen, that's a given. That's something that just kind of goes with the weather. It's like, okay, this is easy. But in 1989, that wasn't the case. And it was the Vietnam veterans who said, we want you to do this and we will be there with you and support you all along the way. So Father's Day 2000, I thought, okay, we need to do something crazy. The world was at relative peace at that time. So these words start spewing out of my mouth as we conclude the ceremony at the wall. I said, uh, the time has come. It's time for us to go to Vietnam and see the places where our dad's fought and died. And before the sun went down that day, there were so many Vietnam veterans and organizations saying, we will support you. Make it happen and we will be there with you all along the way. And they did. That is, that is just amazing. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, I'm always, I'm always struck by the, the many, many ways that that generation of fighting men and women, mostly men, um, the ways that they changed everything for the fighting men and women who came after them. Mm -hmm. The question I is: I have this conversation all the time with people uh, about, you know, the the greatest generation. You know, I think there's an argument to be made, sure, uh, in terms of just the impact that they had after they got home. And you know, I know that we've been talking a long time, and um, but there's so much I can say about it. Um, if I can wrap up the part about the trip to Vietnam. And rest his soul, Tom Corey, for the people who see this and don't know who he is or who he, the life that he led, Tom Corey was shot in the neck by a sniper's bullet. And he came home a quadriplegic. And if that happened when Tom was 22 years of age, Tom died at 74. So he lived 50 years in a wheelchair and he couldn't stand and he couldn't point, but people followed him. People took direction from him. He went with us to Vietnam. And when you saw the other Vietnam veterans on that trip with us, we had 50 Gold Star sons and daughters, and we had 20 Vietnam veterans, combat veterans and nurses there. And when you saw those people carrying Tom in his chair across a rice paddy, Stays with you. Yeah. Um, t 
telling that story is always emotional, but telling it hours after Tom passed away is even more. But that man touched so many lives and influenced and motivated so many people. He was such an incredible inspiration. And he couldn't stand and he barely could move his hands, but he couldn't lift his arms. He needed care all the time, but he cared for more people than that. So that was Father's Day 20, or 2000. We went to Vietnam in, 20, in 2003. We went to Vietnam in 2003. That story has yet to be told because serendipitously we came back and landed in Los Angeles the day that the war in Iraq broke out. Um, but today, when you see what we're doing in this year, where not only are we in the throes of the Vietnam War commemoration and the 50th anniversary of the commemoration of the war, but honoring Vietnam veterans and their families for what will soon be that 50th anniversary of the end of the war. We support the commemoration, we're partners with them, we're making sure that as many people as we can are recognized by the commemoration. This is also the 40th anniversary of the dedication of the wall. That's important to us. We will have a large crowd of sons and daughters in Washington for Veterans Day in November. And amidst all of that, we look at it and say simply, we are the example of what happens when a gold star child grows up. Everybody wants to focus on the picture of the eight-year-old in his Cub Scout uniform at his dad's funeral or the little three-year-old girl or, or something like that. But we are what happens when those gold star children grow up. And so we have taken the lead from Vietnam veterans and reached out to older and younger Gold Star families and been bridge builders. We have great relationships with the Gold Star children from World War II and their organization, the World War II Orphans Network. Great relationships with the families from the Korean War and also incredible relationships and contacts within the Gold Star families from the global war on terror. And so we are right where we're supposed to be. Even though we're 30 years older, you can do the math. If we were in our 20s when SDIT got started, add 33 years, you know where we are and how many candles are on the birthday cake. But um, we've grown up and led lives that have been successful and have been struggles. We've had stumbling blocks. We've had... Uh, We've had stumbling blocks, we've had triumphs and tragedies and all those things that life brings to us. But that's what happens if you allow Gold Star children to grow up. And the most important thing that we can do is give a voice, especially to the older Gold Star families. Folks may not know it, but 92% of all of America's Gold Star families are from wars and conflicts prior to 9-11. And so in, in recent years, we've had to become a little bit more vocal in our advocacy efforts because there were things that could happen that would alter the way that we have been raised to acknowledge the losses that we incurred. And we needed to make sure that we had a voice in that conversation. And so we have, yeah, we've done that. And um, it hasn't always been popular, but the alternative would have been much more unpopular if we hadn't been advocates for this, uh, accepting the kinds of things that were proposed would not have been acceptable. And so we did what we needed to do. So, uh, you know, it's interesting, again, when you think about where Sons and Daughters in Touch is today, what it's become, um, we still don't have paid staff. We may try to change that in the future and I don't, I don't know. In fact, edit that out if you can. Um, I don't want that to be public. Um, but 
we're still an all volunteer organization. We are still the experiencers because we lost our dads in the war. We are also the worker bees making it happen. And whether our fathers were killed in the war or whether they are still unaccounted for, our relationship with the National League of POW MIA families is very strong. We've got plenty of our members who still search for those fates, but we are right where we're supposed to be, being the bridge builders with the older families, the younger families, the different experiences that people have gone through. And uh, if that means that we need to speak up and tell our story a little bit louder, we'll do that. What we did here in our advocacy efforts was most people didn't know about us. They didn't know about us because our name doesn't say who we are. And because we hadn't been advocates, we hadn't been advocates within the Pentagon or on Capitol Hill. And so we have to tell the story. Um, the reason that people didn't know who we were is because for most of those 33 years, we were fulfilling our mission to locate, unite, and support the children whose fathers were lost or remain unaccounted for as a result of the Vietnam War. So that mission statement doesn't say go to Capitol Hill or go to the Pentagon and make sure they know who you are, but that's what the advocacy efforts uh, have resulted in, and that was the justification for doing it. Yeah. You know, one thing is uh, is a little unclear for me, Tony, and, you know, this thing started out as sort of an organic gathering um, and, you know, with some frequency that eventually became every five years. But at what point does it become an organization? At what point did it click and, and become uh, something more than just uh, an organic effort from a bunch of individuals? When we were first started as part of the Friends of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, we were young kids, a little bit restless, and that organization had to decide, do they want to have this separate part of their organization that would be us? And they thought long and hard about it and made a difficult decision. Um, gentleman Bob Dubeck, who was involved with Jan and the establishment of the wall, Bob was the executive director of the Friends of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, and they made a tough decision. They said, no, we want you to go out and do your own thing. And that's when we did that. So that was probably 91, two, somewhere in there. We were recognized as a 501c3. We still obviously have that designation. Um, articles, bylaws, all the other legal things that go along with being uh, a nonprofit. And uh, so that gave us the framework for what we are. And so our board of directors for all of this time has consisted of us the gold star sons and daughters from the Vietnam War. And uh, when I think of the, the, the many people who have served on the board and the people who are currently on the board, you know, I know their stories, I know when their fathers were lost, what branch of service they were in, all these unique stories and each one of them felt the need to give something to this organization so they could be not only the experiencer but also the worker be making it happen. Mm -hmm. How did you decide what role you wanted to play in the organization? Um, what's that? You know, when I don't know, how do I say this? Um, it, it's almost like a joke where everybody's standing around and, and somebody says, I need a volunteer. And everybody, steps back. And everybody backs off and <laughs> you're the last person to back off. So I, I think that's how it all came about. Um, how old were you? Well, we started in 1989, so I was 27 at that time. Yeah. 28. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's, it's been a challenge because whatever you do has to be done in the spare time that you have while also being a husband and a father and now a grandfather and also working. Um, and doing everything else so that this doesn't become your sole focus in life. Yeah. And uh, so it's uh, it's been a challenge, but we have so many people who are supportive of it. We've built great relationships with other organizations. 
And frankly, when I think of where the organization is today, I really wish that a lot of this could have happened 30 years ago, because, you know, if that had been the case, then you could project from that point up to where we are in the, the current times, you know, we may have been a five, 10, $15 million nonprofit with a staff and doing all kinds of great things for gold star families from across the, the spectrum of American history. But uh, it's okay. I mean, it, it is what it is. And, and we are where we're supposed to be right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think yeah, it's such an important, it's such an important role, right? Uh, you know, I've talked to several gold star children uh, for this podcast. I've talked to Cindy Stonebreaker and uh, Rebecca Rush and others and and uh yeah the one thing that's that the the common thread through all of their stories is when i was growing up there was nobody like me i didn't talk yeah. about it you know didn't even talk about it at home in most cases much less at school or with friends and so yeah. uh i'm just imagining the impact that that has for a bunch of kids like that to get together and and like i said just recognize each other you know I, I mentioned earlier talking to a guy today who who didn't know this story about my life he was um the kicker on our football team he was a pretty good kicker and his dad was a world war ii veteran would show up to practice at the uh the end of every football practice and there were always a bunch of dads there and uh the guy i spoke to today he and his brother were both on the team and and uh their dad would show up and again, all these other dads would show up and at the end of practice, fathers and sons were walking off the field. And I know, and I can remember vividly to this day, there were times when I just kind of glanced over there and wondered, is there a chance he'll show up? Is there a chance that this whole thing has been a mistake and, and my dad's going to show up and say, Hey, <laughs> sorry, I didn't get here any sooner. Uh, well, I was going to ask you if there was, uh, you know, in the 30 years that Sons and Daughters in Touch has been doing its work, is there a, is there a story or two that really stands out for you about just the power of that kind of connection? I would selfishly give one and then um, in general terms, give another. I'll do the, the general terms first. And that's the picture behind me. That picture behind me was taken on Father's Day 2010. And uh, there are... I'll have to ask you to describe it because there won't sure. be... Yeah. So, so this picture behind me, uh, if it can't be seen, it's a picture from Father's Day 2010. And there are a couple hundred family members in that picture. It was taken after our Father's Day ceremony on that day, Father's Day 2010. And you have gold star wives who lost their husbands in the war. You have gold star sons and daughters whose fathers are listed on the wall. You have grandchildren and great grandchildren of the men listed on the wall there. And never before had a picture like that ever been taken. And while I'm a little bit partial, to me, that is the most impactful message ever captured at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. If there are 58,281 individuals remembered on the wall, the living DNA of those American heroes is seen in that picture in the faces right there. And then selfishly, if I were to say, Thinking back to my dad's service, he wrote a letter on January 15th of 1964, and he talked about how, let me start that over. He, my dad wrote a letter on January 14th, 1964, telling my mom about how he had lost two very dear friends that day. They were with him as air commandos at Benoit. And that B-26 was downed just outside of the airbase. And my dad said, 
that he feared because of the hostilities in that area that they would never find his two friends. Vince Hickman and Cully Mitchell. And he went on to write in pretty angry words about what had happened and his fear and the fact that death had now stared him in the face and losing these two friends. And so I've read this letter a number of times and I wondered whatever happened there. And when the Parade Magazine article came out in 1990, a letter was received from the Hickman family saying that my sisters and I want to be part of this organization. And it was from Vince Hickman, one of Vince Hickman's daughters, talking about how their family wanted to be part of this. So I have all these letters stored away and I found that letter. And then I thought, out, gosh, I have the letter talking about what happened to their dad. I have a letter from them talking about how they want to be part of Sons and Daughters in Touch. How do I get a hold of them? Fast forward to today, and one of those daughters mentioned in the letter, one of the daughters of Vince Hickman, is now not only a member of Sons and Daughters in Touch, but through this, she has become one of the first people hired into the Congressional Gold Star Families Fellows Program that enables Gold Star families of any age, any generation, to pursue these employment opportunities working as staff members in Congress. So Maureen Hickman, Maureen Hickman Caparazzo, is the living, breathing legacy of that letter that my dad wrote on January 14th when her father was downed and presumably killed. He's still missing, as my dad predicted. But it brings the whole thing full circle. My dad's anger written in a letter, the Hickman daughters writing saying we want to be part of Sons and Daughters in Touch, and today Maureen Hickman being one of those Congressional Gold Star Family Fellows serving in Congress. And I just, I'm tickled by it. I could go on forever talking about that, but to me, it says everything about what Sons and Daughters in Touch should be and the wonderful experience that we as an organization have in just knowing that there's somebody else who lived that life that we led. It makes a difference knowing that you're not alone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Tony, let me just ask you a couple of uh, housekeeping questions. Um, do you want to be referred to in the pod, in the episode as Tony or Anthony? Do you care? Tony's fine. Tony Cordero. Okay. And then uh, how should I describe your role with uh, Sons and Daughters in Touch? I mean, I, I kind of want to say, you know, one of the founders, but I don't know if that's... Yeah, th that is... Um, yeah, you could you could say that. One of the founders and the, the, the board chair. Board chair. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then finally, if you, if you would say your father's name as it, as it is listed on the wall and, uh, and the location where it can be found. Before I do that, I got to say one thing. I don't know if you can put it down. I'm just going to say it so that you can include it because it's timely. When we as an organization look at this new blockbuster movie, Top Gun Maverick, we identify with Maverick because his father, according to the story in Top Gun, his father, Duke Mitchell, was lost on November 4, 1965, when he was flying off of the USS Oriskany. That makes Maverick, the now late 50s instructor in this blockbuster movie, a gold star son of the Vietnam War. So while it is a fictional tale, it is art imitating life, but it's the life that we led and so we identify with that. We really do. Mm -hmm. And so now you wanted me to say my dad's name. That's okay. You were going to, I want to, uh, you and I talked about this a little bit the other day. You know exactly where on the wall Duke Mitchell would be based on. <laughs> yeah. If that story were true, Duke Mitchell would be on panel three East, line 19. 
that follows the chronological and alphabetical order that is laid out there at the wall. It's one panel to the right of my dad. My dad's on panel two east, line 15. Duke Mitchell would be on panel three east, line 19. And uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's a fictional tale, but if it were true, that's where it would be. And it is, as we say, it's that movie is art imitating life, our lives. Right, right. Okay, so would you, just so I have it on tape, just say your father's name and the panel in line. Sure, my dad was William E. Cordero. And he is remembered on the Vietnam Veterans Memorial on panel two east, line 15. 